Hey, in chapter nine of Mark, we see this continual building to Jesus uh, eventually taking his steps towards the cross. So we, we see Jesus here in, uh, in, in chapter nine, and we have the same thing that happened in chapter eight where uh, there is a mess messianic proclamation. We see that through the transfiguration, and we also see that in verse 30 when he begins to talk about his death. And again, the disciples are confused. Um, and and we, so we, we see that through this. We see a heavy teaching on discipleship as he is talking with them about who is the greatest and what does it look like to be great in the kingdom of God. And then we also see just discipleship teachings as he's giving warnings about, you know, hey, like we, uh, we should uh, love children. We should be salt in, in life uh, wherever we are and, and whatnot. And so we see, um, we, we, we see this theme not only in chapter 8, chapter 9, but in then in chapter 10 as well. I want to start by talking about the transfiguration. Uh, there's a lot, and um, I would just like to say in our uh, devotional or in our uh, commentary, there is a great uh, just kind of summary about why the transfiguration is significant. In it, we see just an affirmation of Jesus uh, as the Son of God. We see this moment of, hey, Jesus is fully God. Like this crazy thing. He's the fulfillment of the prophets, all these different things. There's just a great summary that I'm not going to read through, but it is just a, a great thing to, to look for. But in the transfiguration, we see that he's fully God. I love the response that they say. It is, it is good for us to be here. <laughs> like, I just want to be like, duh, it is incredible to sit in the presence of God and to see this miraculous thing. And, and from it, we see this mountaintop experience, literally mountaintop experience, this spiritual moment. And then we move down the mountain, so to speak, and we come down to what's happening. The disciples uh, aren't able to cast out this demon. And I think it just, it's fascinating. And it just goes to show the reminder of, you know, our desperate need for God and how we are in desperate need of Him. And anytime we think we can do something ourselves, or the focus isn't on him, how that often leads to failure and how that often leads to frustration. And so the disciples are frustrated, they are confused, they're facing confrontation, and Jesus comes in and steps in and really challenges them on their faith and on their prayers. And I, I think for us as a church, um, as a Western church, so to speak, it's important for us to maybe focus in here. You know, oftentimes we try to logically um, or academically understand something and there's parts of the Christian faith that are uh, all in faith in the spiritual side to prayer of how these things work and we might discredit some of that or we might try to overanalyze things and over understand and Jesus here is emphasizing the importance of faith and prayer to the disciples it's something important for us to notice and then he gives another prediction of his death and resurrection which again, the disciples are confused. Again, the theme in chapter eight is those who are most closest are, are oft are as confused as well of what his purpose and reason for being here is. And then we f come into a fun conversation starting in verse 33 where they're arguing about who's gonna be the greatest. The disciples are in Capernaum. It's actually the last time they'll be in Capernaum uh, as Jesus takes steps towards the cross. And, um, and Jesus, uh, um, is saying, hey, like, it's not about being the greatest. Stop arguing. And if anyone wants to be first, you must become last. And then whoever welcomes the child welcomes me. And Jesus is challenging the idea of what does power and authority look like? Power and authority looks like serving, and it looks like loving and protecting the weakest and serving the weakest. And so Jesus is again flipping that. And I, I think for us, as oftentimes we confuse power, leadership, authority with things of this earth, and we gotta re be reminded as believers, like we should be looking to, to, to model this idea of service and serving those around us and looking to those who are marginalized or don't have anything to offer us um, and be like, hey, we want to, to love and serve those people. 
I also think it's fascinating. This is just, again, comical, you know? So we see like the, the, the three who are with Jesus at Transfiguration, we see them saying, oh, it is so good to be here. And uh, I think that's funny. Then you have the disciples failing to be able to do this miracle. And then you see John trying to point out, be like, hey, look at those teachers uh, trying to, to, to cast out demons in your name. I think it's funny that after Jesus has, you know, corrected them and saying, hey, like, like talking about their faith and their prayers and the power of both of those things to then realigning them and saying, hey, uh, authority and power in the kingdom isn't what it is on earth. It would be serving those. It's interesting. John here is even trying to elevate himself and saying, you know what? We might have screwed up, but look at those other people who are, who are not doing something right. And, and, and again, Jesus uh, very straightforwardly reminds them and corrects them, but how often do we look at sin or failures in our lives and try to cast blame on others and try to elevate ourselves so that we would look good? All that to say, um, there's a lot in this passage of scripture. There's a lot in these in, in this that we can take away from Jesus and just the incredible nature of the transfiguration. And we see this affirmation and really this, this stake in the ground of Jesus is the Son of God. It is very clear. And but we see from that just the challenges of walking as a believer is even from this mountaintop, you immediately go into the valley and there's failure, there's opposition and how that is our life as followers of Jesus. Like we will have these great spiritual moments, but Jesus desires us to be down doing ministry and there's going to be success. There will be failures and all that teaches us this reliance on God and not ourselves. Um, our, our commentary quoted one of my favorite uh, communicators and pastors, his name's Tony Morita, and he says this, the gospel frees us from our addiction or from the addiction to ourselves. And we see this here in Mark chapter nine, is that part of the beauty of the gospel, part of following Jesus, is that we are, are free from serving ourselves. We're free um, from finding our identity solely in ourselves. We're free from just the weight of having to solve it all and having to, to, to know it all, but we're, we're able to rest in the fact that Jesus holds all power and authority. And as followers of him, we're servants of his, and we walk in that same authority, but it's not up to us, it's all up to him. And so I think as you're wrestling with this text, as you're spending time talking about it, um, I would wrestle as a disciple of Jesus, how does this text directly impact my life? Does that mean, um, like, how am I resting in his authority? Am I resting in, my, in his authority? Am I looking for posture and uh, position and influence and authority for the wrong reasons? All these different things. I think this text um, offers a great heart check and gut check of where we are in pursuing Jesus. And so I hope you have a powerful time in discussion.